Good evening, everybody, and you're all very welcome to this, the fifth lecture in the Uniscape online series, Landscape, where the disciplines meet. Um, I want to start by thanking Sandor Nemethy, who is our speaker. I'll introduce him for a moment, or in a moment, rather, for sharing that video with us. Um, I mean, it's so clear and graphic 
and attractive. It should be mandatory viewing for every politician on the surface of the earth, as far as I'm concerned. So I will certainly be circulating it among the body politic um, here in Ireland. Um, tonight's speaker is Sandor Nemethy, who is a senior researcher in regional development at the University of Pex in Hungary. He's also the associate professor of conservation in the University of Gothenburg. Um, the respondent is Giuseppe Lopapa from the University of uh, Palermo, where he works in the Department of Agricultural, Food and Forest Sciences. So we'll hear from Giuseppe uh, at the end of the talk. Um, tonight's paper is an examination, I suppose, of the effects, both beneficial and adverse, of woody biomass production in different contexts. Um, and with particular focus on uh, the effects on wildlife and biodiversity. So we're looking forward to the paper. Sandor himself has a very interesting career and I want to just uh, start by thanking him for being such a cooperative correspondent uh, in the build up to uh, the lecture series. Every time we emailed you, you were straight back, very efficient understood all the instructions and provided us with some excellent information. So I, uh, sure. with that uh, uh, track record, I expect that the paper will be every bit um, as good. Um, so Sandor, a, a, a bit like our second uh, speaker in the series has a very interesting um, professional formation going from um, the caring professions, from social work and caring for the elderly, right now down to his work on agri-tourism, uh, bio uh, 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 biodiversity, the production of bioenergy, soil uh, science, uh, rural economics, and wine science, um, which I'm sure the field work in that would have been very interesting. So if we ever take up that challenge again, Sandor, we'll be there with you. Um, and also Sandor works in the whole area of eco-museums. And this provides me with a bridge to, uh, to announce a change in the programme for our next lecture. So um, uh, on the 1st of June, a colleague of Sandor's uh, will be giving the paper that had previously been scheduled for the very end of June. So Boss Lagerqvist, who is here on, on screen, um, will be lecturing on the 1st of June on landscape-based eco-museums, uh, a conservation of landscapes through community participation and green circular economy. So um, the two papers actually fit together very well. So we're glad now that they're juxtaposed um, pretty well, uh, kind of kind of side by side within the series itself. So um, I'm going to hand over to Sandor. The floor is yours. I, I think you you will have control of the uh, yes. screen. And when Sandor finishes, then we'll hand over to Giuseppe Lopapa, who will give a response, and then we'll open up the um, the floor to questions and comments from the audience. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and uh, it is a really great honor to uh, give a lecture um, in a framework of Uniscape, which I think is uh, for some for me a symbol of uh, uh, advanced and very much sustainable landscape conservation, and more than that. Uh, so. Um, I am going to try. I hope that everybody will see the. Uh, do you see the screen? Is the it is visible? Yes, it's okay. Yes, it's okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to talk about agroforestry, energy plantations, and landscape management, and. Um, land use and biodiversity and wildlife habitats, which is in fact the very special uh, area of expertise of my, uh, my good friend and colleague, uh, uh, Professor Laszlo Samati. Um, it is also very important uh, regarding landscape remediation and reclaiming landscapes, which are about uh, uh, getting lost in uh, very, very intensive and uh, 
very often only economically thinking. But with a lot of interesting problems, we are going to talk about this. What you see in the first screen, that is a photo of what I have taken in South Africa when I was there, because uh, they have very interesting agroforestry. And a lot of trees, not here, but a little bit uh, further, which you call blue, blue gums, i.e. eucalyptus, which is used for agroforestry and for energy as well. What is agroforestry, in fact? Um, uh, before we get there, we need to think about the renewable energy, because many people believe that uh, biomass produced by forestry is only useful for energy. Well, uh, we should have a more um, differentiated view on this. Energy production, of course, can, can be a local, regional, national, and global system. But, uh, and we also know that in natural terrestrial systems, it's connected to the biogeochemical cycles. And it's often altered by human activities, which will result in adverse environmental impacts, and not only greenhouse gas emissions, but a lot of other adverse emissions. And um, also important that uh, when we talk about renewable energy, it is not only carbon dioxide, it is a lot of other environmental issues regarding not only pollution, but regarding land use, which is very important for us. And the production and use of renewable energy, when we talk about bioenergy, solar power, wind, and geothermal energy, were in fact a key for sustainability, including the, also the economic viability. But we have a time factor here. When we are talking about that you must have a very intensive economic growth and um, which need to be viable, the growth or the planet. So I am, it, it is also an important issue because uh, the limitless economic growth, I refer here to Dennis Meadows, uh, is uh, not sustainable. You can have a balance, a normal uh, system thinking with regard to uh, use of natural resources and the needs which need to be satisfied. How do you steer it? Dedicated bioenergy crops may increase the soil carbon sequestration, of course, contributing to the reduction of global warming. But we need to know that we are talking about two carbon cycles. One is the biological one. The second one is the geological one, the liturgical carbon cycle, talking about the calcium carbonate producing organisms which uh, bind up enormous amounts of carbon dioxide in form of calcium carbonate, for instance, occurrence in the seas. Uh, but um, when we talk about uh, the bioenergy crops and the uh, burning biomass, we need, need to think about how we burn it. Because uh, burning wood with antiquated old stoves is putting out an awful lot of dangerous chemicals to the environment, for instance, dioxins. And so you need to have the right combustion technology for any burning of, of uh, biomass as well. But if you have it, then we need to uh, look at other issues. Fast growing woody bioenergy plantations can produce large quantities of biomass in a short time. And here is coming the trap, the economic trap. Uh, how we counterbalance land use, reckless land use, only producing uh, biomass. And where do we produce biomass? That's why agroforestry, in a classical uh, way, is uh, 
combining trees and agriculture is a very primitive definition. There is a little bit more uh, detailed one. And uh, it is also true that agroforestry should be an integral component of multifunctional agriculture, which is a future, i.e. not only monoculture. And, and then we are somewhat a uh, little bit ahead of a very important issue, you call it circular economy, which is in fact much better if you call it bioeconomy. Because uh, uh, we are coming to this a little bit later. Possible advantages of energy plantations. We know that we can establish energy plantation uh, on arable lands, which is a disaster because you shall not use good land which, which is suitable for food production for energy. In the United States, you can encounter this problem with uh, uh, maize production, reckless maize production. Uh, uh, and it is uh, to produce bioethanol. And uh, <clears throat> it is also important uh, to use bioenergy plantations where they make some good environmentally, not only bioenergy. For instance, phytoremediation of wastelands and polluted areas. And the more permanent cover that provides shelter and biomass for feeding, this is important, for instance, animals in winter time, higher architectural complexity, and uh, uh, sorry, it was a uh, higher architectural complexity of vegetation. It will provide more place for nesting and feeding. And also root filtration and phytoremediation, which will reduce the chemicals. Very often, land is polluted by uh, organic material or hydrocarbons. It can be used, can be uh, totally healed by using suitable uh, bioenergy crops, doing hair by two different issues. And also important that forests in the undergrowth and young shoots could provide better quality food for wildlife than the intensive monocultures. Because have you, you have a higher biodiversity you, uh, in, the, in the plants, it, regard, it gives you also higher biodiversity in the animal populations. And the solution is a complex management system, in fact. And what is the multifunctional agriculture? We have the conventional mainstream agricultural production when you uh, often use monoculture, organic, uh, inorganic fertilizers. Sometimes you make, uh, you reduce biodiversity. And uh, it is also a problem that uh, it can be simply uh, a uh, non-soil of soil because of uh, uh, intensive fertilizer use, but, uh, and you can use a lot of different services simultaneously, for instance, energy production, crop, biogas, solar, wind, fiber crops, and so on. Then we come to the economic side. What is bioeconomy? It's more than circular economy because you look at the biosphere. You, you put ecosystem services into the focus. And um, uh, the bio-based economy is a new model for the industry and the circular, in fact, for the circular economy as well. But it's, it is much more than simple recycling of resources. It is more to the regenerative approach. You are talking about the renewability saving fossil resources, it is a climate friendly and improved productivity and sustainability. Improving productivity and sust improving sustainability includes also a regenerative approach. And here you can see the main track, agriculture and forestry producing biomass processing and, the, and it will be food and feed. And you are getting uh, closer to the natural cycles of Earth, the biogeochemical cycles, because all processes are cycle processes which uh, need to be sustained in Earth. 
So, <clears throat> so we come to the agroforestry. It is a, a leaky in 1996 defined it as a dynamic ecologically based natural resource management system that through the integration of trees in farm and range and diversifies and sustains smallholder production for increased social, economic, and environmental benefits. And they say, okay, small orders, or what, what about the big ones? Well, it is turning out that through the multifunctional agriculture, even larger producers can look at diversified production. What you see here is a the silvy pasture, uh, uh, or you can have uh, woods in maize plantations, providing biodiversity and also improving, of course, soil quality as well. And what is a why agroforestry? So the rapid expansion of agriculture for food, fuel, and other products has resulted in significant greenhouse emissions. That is true. And in fact, 18.4% of global green uh, CAG, uh, GAG emissions are associated with deforestation and degradation. And here with agriculture is a major component of human factors of global climate change mitigation efforts, i.e. are there any efforts to mitigate the climate change when they are cutting down rain rainforest or polluting seas, which is a vast carbon trap? No, so we need to uh, look a little bit at the more complex picture. And uh, if you understand the development of the agricultural sector and its impact on forest, we can propose integrated solutions. And this is the main issue. If you look at that, um, uh, greenhouse emissions are talking about 73.2% energy production is responsible for it. And also, not only carbon dioxide, of course, we are talking about carbon dioxide equivalent. There are a lot of other greenhouse gases, methane, there are uh, sulfur hexafluoride, the uh, nitrous gases, and so on. So they talking about the agroforest, so this is a well-known picture, I suppose, for many. How do we put it in system? How we can operate it? How it can work in a map? You need the, then you have the different conditions. You get a GIS layer of every single issue. The vegetation, the normalized difference vegetation index, the wetness, soil pH, absolutely vital. The nutrient status, soil organic matter, rainfall, elevation, slope. Look here, soil is that important. Not for nothing is in the heart of the Bretton diagram is soil one of the most important natural resources. And, and we are looking here, the NPK, uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, which are uh, the three main uh, nutrients, and also uh, the artificial uh, inorganic nutrients are there. Well, uh, when we are looking at the ag agroforestry, what, where, and when, then we have different systems. Land protection plantations will have done. They will allow you can, can control the water table. Very often, in case of deforestation, people lose the water table control. The fluctuation of the water table might result in, uh, in salt accumulation in the upper, uppermost layers of soils. Broad acre planting, biodiversity plantings, uh, often very often in land reclaiming methods and streamside plantings, which might uh, also prevent erosion. And you have these overlapping areas when you're talking about integrated whole farm agroforestry and, and also break of soil plantings, uh, also good for erosion prevention, windbreaks and shelter beds. And we shall not forget phytoremediation I was already talking about. And you have the industrial plantations. Industrial plantations are own land, leased land, chain planting, all of them very often by energy plantations, but not always, because you have, of, of course, industry plantations also for 
wood as material. And then you have small scale farm woodlots, which are, can be very important, particularly in peri-urban ecosystems. And if you look at the sustainability of wood biomass production, I, I don't use always agroforestry because not all agroforestry wood biomass production can be given the very nice name of, of agroforestry. Very often it can be similar to monoculture if it is intensive, particularly if they use an awful lot of artificial fertilizers. But again, I will tell you a couple of good examples, of course, from Sweden as well which is really interesting how they recirculate results. Environment is sustainable in terms of carbon uh, dioxide emissions and low pollution only in case of advanced combustion technologies. As I said. Shall not occupy land where food production is possible. Suitable for fetalization of polluted areas, a lot of crops, for instance, are and there are a lot of woods as well. Um, wood biomass production can also be part of the hyper accumulator of, uh, of heavy metals as well. And, um, and uh, very much, for instance, poplar, certain poplar clones might break down even persistent organic pollutants, chlorinated hydrocarbons. It can be suitable for final stages of wastewater treatment when you use irrigation with purified wastewater. And here is a very good example, for instance, Sweden, close to Inchirping at Hedemura, when you have vast salix plantations, willow plantations for bioenergy, which are irrigated with purified, biologically purified wastewater, and with avoiding any artificial fertilizers. Cultivation methods, and they are, of course, they were varied by diversity. The large scale biomass plantations can be similar to agricultural monocultures. So they are not really agroforestry. But conservation of wildlife habitats or creation of new habitats, it is also an issue. And it is also possible with the right rotation cycles and also biodiversity. And I will show you soon about uh, the different uh, uh, cultivation methods. And what people so often forget about when you're talking about forestry, talking about ecosystems, the ecotones. The ecotones which do contain uh, the components of the two ecosystems, on the border of those, they are situated and they are very important buffer zones. If ecotones are eliminated or harmed, then the ecological sustainability and the collision of two different ecosystems cannot be avoided. And uh, in fact, the real agroforestry as, as I said, ecosystem centered. And what are the most important factors of wood biomass production regarding the protection of wildlife habitats and landscape conservation? Excellent of land use change. If we replacement a natural vegetation by bioenergy crops, what and why? It is a good natural vegetation and the natural forest vegetation, it should not be replaced. If it is a harmed ecosystem where a natural vegetation occurred, there might be certain motives to do so. But land reclamation, that is a, that is the whole thing when it comes to remediation, conversion of industrial land to agricultural land. And the change of managed forestry to intensive monoculture, it is not really agroforestry. And also important, the type of the energy crop. I, I'm talking about three here. There are many, much more, the three main crops, willow, poplar, and black locust. Black locust is good also on those areas which are drier and they used to bind up the sand the, on those areas where, where the wind blown sand um, was quite unpleasant, even in certain parts of Hungary. Then very important is the cultivation method. Short rotation coppicing, it is the most intensive method. The short rotation forestry, where you give a little bit more time to the forest to grow and 
to habitats de develop. And the policy of arboriculture is in fact an Italian invention. In the Italy, they made a very successful uh, um, system of it in many places. And then a traditional agroforest, even when it is a part of the um, uh, agriculture. What you can see here is a willow, it's black locust and poplar plantations there. Then we can look at the short radiation copies in Europe, and you can see that uh, what is the crop density, rotation years, diameter of the harvest, height at harvest, the growing stock, the moisture contact, that's very, very important when you burn things, and where it is cultivated now. So willow, most, mostly Northern Europe and British Europe. Today there are quite a few clones even in Middle Europe. Poplar is typically in Central Europe and black locust, both in Central and Southern Europe. Originally, of course, we know that black locust is an American species. But we, need, we do understand that short tradition coppicing is an intensive and very controlled cultivation. In certain conditions, it can be environment friendly. We are talking about wildlife habitats and it is quite important to know what is the ecological effect. That's why we need to look at the modeling, the biodiversity ecosystem function, which is crucial in this case. And um, we are talking about the competence and processes. It was a bit based on willow. And you can see the environment, looking at the components, climate, geology, and geomorphology. And you, which will, uh, of course, uh, somewhat beside the plant uh, traits and then even ecophenotypic variability of plants, the phenotype and the genotype, which uh, may furnish the plants with certain abilities, for instance, adaptation to the environment or even remediation of the environment. Then we look at the living systems here, the uh, in the top, the herbivory, and uh, talking about the avian and insect herbivory and population dynamics, which are living there. We're talking about the identity of community uh, plant population dynamics, and very important, the soil biota and bacteria, which are dependent on the, the plant populations. And here's coming the biomass production, very important, the nutrient cycling. And um, of course, the carbon dynamics regarding the uh, soil and groundwater uh, interaction. And basically, totally, we are talking about the resilience and the temporary stability of this uh, system. So the biodiversity ecosystem function is talking about the more biodiversity and uh, is basically more resilient. We are going to see it in other model with our, what I will show you, which is based on this. Um, so the biodiversity and the habitats, we know that it can produce even the short radiation copies, different plant habitats, if you give enough time for them. But there is a fluctuation when you harvest, then a function of sheltering is uh, going to vanish for a certain time. But the landscape scale value of plantations for biodiversity is changes. It is changing depending on the harvest cycles and even over time. Because there is a cycle about 25 years, for instance, for willow, when you change the plantations. But the structural landscape element can positively contribute to biodiversity on certain conditions. Looking at the ecological effect, the climate and the soil, the ecological preference of the cultivated main crop species, rotation cycles, as I said, very important, and the species composition of the plantations, important, not necessarily monoculture. You can have a profitable uh, short rotation cop copies system, even if you have a mixed species plantation. And the cultivation methods, of course, which includes the irrigation, as I mentioned, for instance, with purified wastewater and nutrient supply. 
And this is the regarding the ecological viability. Uh, back again to the um, um, eco, to the biodiversity ecosystem function, and here it is quite important to see that uh, uh, you look at the high plant diversity and low plant diversity. It is not a big issue to discover that the higher plant diversity will result in a high resource quality and quantity. But we shall not forget about the fertilization. Because if you have a high plant diversity and the normal biogeochemical cycles in the plant soil system, you usually do not need artificial fertilization. If you have a higher artificial fertilization, of course, it will result in a lower density because artificial fertilization can knock out the soil biota if it is recklessly used. And usually uh, there are perfect ecological methods. Then we can think about it, which form of woody vipers plantations are best suited for creation and conservation of wildlife habitats? Well, the traditional agroforestry, of course, as we mentioned, the polycyclic arboriculture, when you have different plant species, three species in one system with different coppice times at different ages. And of course, there is a kind of short rotation forestry where you give about 10, 15 years to the plants to grow, not entirely biomass, but you have also multiple use of that, for, of that forest. And the short rotation coppice is the last one only with longer rotation times, having higher biodiversity, no artificial fertilizers, placing in the landscape a mosaic. So this is the other issue. And taking into consideration the ecotones. In these systems, you do take into consideration the ecotones. Then we can look at the wildlife habitat value. For each factor, uh, the quality is associated with greater wildlife benefit or less impact are listed here in the, in, the, in the right. And if you have a cropland, lower wildlife habitat value, higher diverse uh, native habitats, it is higher value. Exotic monocultures, they absolutely reduce the biodiversity in the whole system. So uh, not only the crops, but they do create a low biodiversity system, even in the soil and so on. And uh, no unharvested are in the field, of course, it is lower. And uh, unharvested are within the uh, uh, fields give a higher diversity. Basically, for instance, using a sensible crop rotation can be quite a good idea. And what is the impact of, uh, of the wildlife? If you have a monoculture, it can be higher uh, and lower if you have a, a more natural, marginal cropland, minimal input, low input agriculture in, uh, with other modes, and we, you combine forestry with agriculture. And we, when we uh, mention permaculture for many agricultural engineers, they got really angry. They said, oh, it is not realistic. Well, Similar to that might be a reality in future more man better managed agricultural systems. What are the conclusions then? In the wood biomass production, uh, longer rotation cycles and greater biodiversity are particularly beneficial in agriculture systems and polycyclic arboriculture, where you have a or in those short tradition plantations, of course, where the length of rotation cycles allows more the short tradition forestry. But usually, the short tradition coppicing, when you uh, harvest every second year or third year, it is not always that good. Uh, in fact, very rarely good. You need to link woody bioenergy plantation and phytoremediation can greatly increase the sustainability of biomass production and also the resilience of landscape when you reclaim destroyed and polluting land. 
Also, if you have a holistic and integrated food and energy system, then there is no conflict between bioenergy production and food supply. And also the ecological footprint can be quite small. And uh, the technological development is not an, uh, not an adversary of environment. It can be good, can be very beneficial if used sensibly. It can significantly improve the competitiveness and efficiency of bioenergy. But bioenergy usually will not be the only source, but uh, putting into the system of renewable energy, it can be a very important component. As I mentioned in the beginning of the lecture, uh, uh, sorry. As I mentioned in the beginning of the lecture, it can be a very good component of multifunctional agriculture. So thank you very much for your attention. I hope I did not exceed too much in the time of what I had. Thank you very much. So this was what I wanted to tell today. Okay, so thank you very much for that, Sandor. Um, I, I, I need to apologize uh, to Laszlo Smethi at the very start. I forgot to mention that it was a co-authored paper. And uh, of course, I, I can't see your face, but I can see that you're here. Um, so my apologies for, 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 for actually forgetting to mention uh, your name. And I take it then that as a co-author um, that we can hand the floor over to you at question time as well. Um, I, 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 I can also see from the, the content of your paper, Sandor, why you, uh, you recommended Giuseppe Lopapa uh, to be the respondent, because the connection between uh, soil health and biodiversity seems very clear. And I was struck when I was watching the opening video on the, uh, the statistics in terms of freshwater supply and accessibility, that those statistics are likely to be replicated in terms of uh, soil availability on yes. um, the surface of the planet. So there's a very strong connection um, coming through there. So Giuseppe Lopapa, who I mentioned earlier on in the talk, is a soil scientist, especially um, uh, specializing in his research in anthropogenic soils and crop suitability. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Giuseppe now. You have to turn on your mic, Giuseppe, and uh, the floor is yours to offer a response to, uh, to Sandor and Laszlo's paper. Okay, thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, lecture. Um, I think this, this program uh, of lectures is very, very interesting. So uh, unfortunately, I just knew um, for this occasion. Um, well, I'm very proud to be the, the discussant and the, the respondent of, of this couple of guys, uh, which I, <laughs> who I know very well. Uh, in my in my life, so I think uh, the presentation was very interesting. Was um, plenty of of topics, very interesting topics, and aspects, of course. And I think it was quite complete. Uh, but uh, I would like just to show some some slides, just to start to stimulate also a few the further uh, further questions from the the the, the audience. Um, Okay. Okay. I guess I guess everyone is just um, just just uh, could could see my presentation. Uh, well, um, first of all, so we are talking about. Uh, I know Shandor is uh, very keen on this topic because you know. Shandor and Laszlo, they have a very, very wide experience uh, and very wide background. Um, usually when we talk about um, agroforestry, uh, it's a topic uh, that has been studied since a long time, is well-established topic and connected with many, many, uh, many sciences, like for example, land use science or policy or uh, practice. Um, so, and everyone is going to demonstrate, and Chandor did the same in, in, in this presentation, the, the benefits of these uh, uh, agroforestry systems, or 
he better say, uh, um, multifunctional, multifunctional land use, multifunctional agriculture. Uh, in, in effect, I think that agriculture, this is just a statement that could be also a question to, to stimulate um, the, the further questions, that agroforestry is a form of multifunctional agriculture at the end. So, and uh, this, uh, e even if the, this, this, the modern concept of, of agroforestry is, uh, um, is uh, quite recent, I mean, um, probably the 20, 20th century, um, the use of the, 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 the agroforestry uh, uh, in agricultural system is quite ancient. Uh, I mean, we, we, we have found uh, a description uh, written, uh, written description um, in uh, dating back at the Roman Empire. Uh, well, uh, we, we, we probably, um, uh, we have also to consider that uh, this kind of uh, integration between trees, crops, uh, animals, it's, it's a long, long tradition, okay, uh, through the, the humanity and the agriculture. Uh, I just read some, some years ago some, some statistics, statistics uh, from the, the World Bank that probably more than one billion of people, okay, is using uh, uh, agroforestry practices. So that is just to, to, to uh, emphasize which is the, the, the importance of this, uh, this topic. So, but I want to, to, to take you uh, to this, this uh, uh, that seem a new topic, okay? Uh, we, we should not forget that we are going to achieve some, some goals. So the humanity should go uh, the, uh, to achieve some goals. And we know very well this, this picture. So we are going to achieve what we call uh, sustainable development goals. Okay, this is a, 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 is a statement, is a sort of statement we are going to, to achieve in the future. But of course, to achieve this, um, this, um, uh, the, these, these goals, the sustainable development goals, we have to face, of course, some global existential challenges. So, which are these? So we have food security, we have water security, of course. We have energy sustainability, climate change, human health, biodiversity protection, and I put inside soil security. You probably say, okay, you are a soil scientist, but I can demonstrate that soil and also Shandor uh, demonstrated with a presentation that soil is uh, the most important part of the landscape is the most, most important part of the, of the environment. There is no uh, landscape, there is uh, no, even no human life without, without the soil. So we are going to face these challenges for our uh, future. This is global existential challenges. Of course, um, Shandor uh, highlighted very well that agroforestry uh, and sustainable landscape management are key strategies, of course, for implementing uh, and achieve, achieve uh, for achieving these, these uh, uh, sustainable development goals uh, all over the world, of course. And um, usually, um, these two topics, agroforestry and sustainable landscape management, management have been uh, seen or have been studied in, 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 um, as, uh, um, in isolation. I mean, so uh, there, is, there, there is no connection from the scientific point of view in the past. So ob obviously when we talk about the, uh, the um, we have to face about uh, landscape approaches to achieve sustainability, of course, obviously. Uh, we, ha we, ha we have to talk about uh, uh, not just this integration between the two sciences I, I, I just uh, told you before, but also adapt adopting uh, uh, multi-objective uh, approaches and probably also uh, all the multi-stakeholders approaches. And that is probably um, a requirement. Uh, I'm very surprised to show to you this, this because I've been visiting uh, just uh, two days ago, this 
this farm, which is in Sicily, and uh, they are just making business with this uh, um, multifunctional, uh, multifunctional farm. Uh, is not something new. We, we already already told you that is not something new, but it seemed that like the people uh, is going to open the eyes on this kind of new uh, or this this new form. I mean, not new. This form of, of agriculture, which is agroforestry, which is multifunctional uh, multifunctional agriculture. But of course, to achieve our development goals, we have to think that we, we, we already have to upscale at landscape scale um, the, the, the agroforestry. So we have to think, we have to talk about multifunctional landscapes. Okay, because just a farm uh, is not enough. We need landscape, multifunctional landscape or uh, different, even, even larger scales. Of course, so uh, the, the uh, UNESCO recognized the importance of the, the benefits of the agroforestry or the multifunctional agriculture. Uh, indeed, uh, we have some um, UNESCO cultural landscapes that are uh, showing the system of the, 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 the agroforestry. So at the end, what we, uh, um, how we can achieve these, uh, these, um, these, these development goals? Um, Shandor say agroforestry and and uh, um, multifunctional agriculture could have uh, could 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 bring a, a, a very huge contribute a huge contribution on achieving this goal. So uh, probably um, at the moment I could say that we, we, we have some we can we can achieve some some goals uh, directly with agroforestry, no poverty, zero hunger, uh, well-being, uh, affordable and clean energy. Um, and of course the rest uh, we could achieve even with agroforestry, with multifunctional agriculture, uh, um, even in in an indirect way. Um, okay, just to say these, just some uh, few um, few few sentences to 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 stimulate uh, the, the the questions, the further questions. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much to Shandor and and uh, Laszlo to be uh, very 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 um, complete on this topic. So thank you very much, Giuseppe, uh, for that response. I, I, I'm, I'm going to pass it open uh, to the floor now, but it just seems to me that, 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 that there's a couple of messages that are coming through very strongly here. And one is the strength in diversity and that diversity favors the individual and small scale actor um, as well. So in fact, there's a cultural gain in diversity in the first instance, but as you say, Giuseppe, we need to work on a much bigger scale as well and generate these multifunctional landscapes as well, and perhaps even a bigger scale than that, as you were saying. So it strikes me that that's a very interesting uh, point of departure in terms of the discussion, because we're all aware of um, the challenges that are facing so many parts of rural Europe. Um, and the, uh, the nature of the landscape and the nature of the economy and the society lending itself to a particular scale. And if that scale can be, uh, can be demonstrated to have a, a very kind of, kind of distinct and specific advantage, then that to my mind is all to the good. So I'll open the, um, the floor now to questions and uh, comments. So if you go down to the bottom of your screen there, you'll see we have a chat box as well. But um, if, if you want to raise your hand, um, then um, uh, Tommaso will, will invite you to turn on your mic and you shoot. So um, the first hand up is from Sarah Govan. So do you want to, uh, to turn on your mic, Sarah? And Hi, thank you. Um, that was a, a fascinating presentation and a really thoughtful um, discussion response. Um, I'm based in Scotland and we are 
grappling with um, the idea of multifunctional land use in particularly my role is in around climate change but I also have an interest in in landscape and historic land use and I'm just interested in any of your thoughts about how we how we actually achieve a, a practical approach to that multifunctionality so just as an example Scotland has developed a land use strategy um, but you can publish a document that doesn't actually then bring processes. So, how you know, how, what are your thoughts on how we get the decisions on the ground, particularly when you do have balances of um, economy and financial drivers um, that might drive some of the energy? I know there are concerns here with some of those energy crop issues. And so there's an ideal we want. And I'm just interested in how you think we might get to that without trying to enforce anything. <laughs> I'll stop there. <laughs> okay, so if you would like to respond to that, Laszlo or Shandor or, or even Giuseppe or somebody else, you need to turn on your mic. Uh, yes, yeah, so, so that is one of the most difficult questions because uh, there are uh, huge differences among uh, the sides. So uh, now we discussed about uh, very interesting questions, but the basic is the adaptation to the local uh, possibilities and the local environmental cons uh, constraint. So first of all, we should need, we, we should know more about the local circumstances, uh, environmental circumstances, the patterns of the different uh, uh, abiotic and biotic factors. And after that, uh, we can decide about the different kind of land use so uh, actually we have to we, we are we have the possibility to to use the remote sensing techniques and uh, other so-called big data issues but uh, nowadays i'm afraid that we have too many data and uh, it is very difficult to find the right way in this jungle so uh, that's why uh, the elaboration of uh, decision support systems would be necessary. Uh, decision support systems, not uh, only for the uh, uh, policy makers and uh, great men who create nice strategies and others all over Europe and all over the world, but uh, locally, very, very locally, on a farm, on a several hundred acres or, or several seven dozen of acres, to know what is the best solution and also uh, let me add uh, uh, an idea to the to the presentations so we uh, what is biodiversity what does it mean so when we uh, speak about these multifunctional uh, uh, farms uh, or multifunctional agriculture we have to be very careful because if we have a large farm 1000 hectares then it can be multifunctional with big uh, patches okay but it is not biodiversity biodiversity means locally so in the same site we need uh, as much species as possible as much relations as possible as much uh, ecological ecological functions as possible so uh, i think that this would be the the main message uh, from this one of the main message from this pre presentation so I, I've spoken a lot, and uh, it means that I don't know. I'm sorry. So <laughs> we have to know more from the local area. Thanks. Okay, thank I think, you. Uh, I think we could add a, well, just a little. Sarah, I suppose you might know a very good friend of us and an excellent lady who is living in Scotland in the Fintorn Echo Village, May East. I think it is. Uh, Fintorn Echo Village is a fantastic example uh, that they could, in very harsh environments, produce local ecological cycles and using everything in a small scale, uh, taking into account all possible ecosystem services, uh, building up on each other in a climate which is not very much favorable for uh, larger scale agricultural production. Uh, but uh, it can be something like that, uh, uh, quite a good idea to, to, to go further. 
but as as, uh, as Lasso said, it's, uh, Lasso said it's, uh, of, of course, it is not easy to do it in a larger scale, but very much uh, can be a, a, a way to uh, go locally by thinking, uh, by thinking global on a larger scale. Uh, Scotland is uh, otherwise a fantastic site. I've been there quite a few times, but uh, really interesting. Uh, so I think that something what they are doing in Fintron Echo Village can give quite a few ideas how to go further. I don't know whether you know them. So but Sarah, okay. just to, um, to come back to your question then as well, um, of trying to achieve an end without uh, kind of enforced regulation um, through encouragement rather than regulation. And I just want to ask you whether you, there's a connection between um, your landscape character assessments that have been carried out throughout Scotland and the potential land uses. Um, so in other words, is there a mapping of those two things of the Scottish land use strategy onto the landscape character assessment or are they treated as being kind of separate uh, phenomena? That's a good question. It's a bit early to say in some ways because we've had a land use strategy as a kind of concept tied to climate change since 2011 was the first one but it's only in the last six months that government have committed to regional land use partnerships there's been quite a a drive both within and, and wider across government has been a, a range of initiatives that have come together so they've set up six pilot um, regional strategy areas and they're going to start with regional partnerships and those regional partnerships um, to reflect some pilot studies they did a few years ago but they um, and, and don't quote me on this because I'm not going to get the words right but they map across to um, strategic planning tools that have recently been developed where they're bringing um, one or more local authorities together so they are trying to match up with existing structures so that land use will integrate with wider planning decisions and the landscape character assessment does play into that so it is a factor although as you can tell i'm not sure to what extent that it is in the hierarchy of consideration and just to sound completely bureaucratic i used to work for scottish government but i i'm now at the university of edinburgh but i can't get the civil servant out of me um there is a national planning framework due to publish this year so they are on on paper, I think the government is trying to integrate these approaches. And I think what's interesting from my point of view is how you set up all the structures, but then you actually get the people on the ground, the communities, the landowners, the local authorities, the businesses, the structures to sit down and find a way through that doesn't rely on a decision being made in 2045. I think we're all scratching our heads on those. <laughs> right across, as I look at the names here on screen, right across Europe, we're all struggling with the same things. It's trying to get the different departments of government to coordinate their action yeah. in one direction. Um, do you want to come in, Verla, or uh, possibly Tessa, based on your own experience of that? No, they don't. Okay, is anybody else like to to add a comment or make a question? I think everyone has been silenced. Um, so- Sorry, sorry, I have a question. I am okay, not able Carmelo. to yes. raise my hands. Okay, come in Carmelo, perfect. Oh, thanks a lot and my best congratulations, Sandro. Thank you very um, much. Uh, my attention was stimulated by your, uh, um, at the beginning of your presentation, do, do you, do you refer to the importance of bioeconomy and also in uh, agroforestry. I believe that at the European level, uh, uh, the importance of uh, uh, bioeconomy uh, is not uh, fully uh, uh, acknowledged particularly among uh, um, politicians. Yes. I don't know, I, I suppose that you know that recently was approved by the European Parliament, the new, uh, the new let me say, uh, uh, initiative concerning soil protection. So going back to the, the importance of bioeconomy, 
I, I would like to know uh, um, your opinion on uh, which kind of strategies do the researchers, uh, uh, do the people involved in researchers on, in university or in agency plan to increase the importance of bioeconomy awareness in uh, particularly among the politicians? I think uh, I could say something that I think we, we, we discussed it with Laszlo, with Lazzi, very quite a lot, uh, lots of time, because usually uh, we are always trying to save the world. Uh, in fact, bio, uh, it is very much up to uh, education also. When we were doing our Sunkra program, you remember, Carmelo, it just has a purpose to produce, educate also people who are dealing with, uh, with politics to understand the eco ecosystem. So basically, the bioeconomics is an ecosystem based economy, uh, which is a little bit more than circular. It's not only, it's not only about recycling, it is understanding the whole system. And the biggest problem is, is two. With politicians always uh, very often do think in short terms between two mandate periods. They say, all right, in the first year, I try to find my place in the in the power structure. Two years I work, and the last year I am concentrating how to win the next elections. So now the problem is that they need to think strategically, and the strategy is a longer term, a far longer term operation plan than a four years mandate period. But if they can handle things, looking at uh, communicating to the, the general public. And that's why I think that uh, the right communication, the social marketing of the bioeconomy, particularly, uh, and it is up to also the scientific civil organizations, which can have an outreach activity to show people what is the crisis. And uh, uh, then um, it can be possible. Also important that uh, to look at, I see a big education crisis as well, because uh, very often uh, today's students uh, and uh, people are getting more and more specialized. And the narrow specialization means uh, producing professional idiots. They know one thing, they can write 2000 articles about the ninth leg of the spider, without understanding the system. So system thinking doesn't necessarily require university professorship, basically, we are talking about. It is our duty to show people an understandable system thinking, but reforming education at, from the primary school level and building it up to the university, this is one issue. And the other issue is to get together the politicians who are responsible for their duty, but also important that politicians who are responsible for a particular area, say agriculture, do understand their own field. The problem is that very often you put a lawyer in a, and you can find a, a I, I know a lot of very good lawyers, but uh, you can find people who are totally urban people talking about agriculture, and they may say a cattle only if they shave themselves in the mirror in the morning. No, no, and this is a problem. So they 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 should know. Uh, so having a more competence based and system based thinking. I think you, you, you hit very, very well. You, you put your uh, finger on the, on, on the main artery, uh, Carmelo, here, because this is a, having that. Uh, and, and here we have an interesting function. So, so we, we lots of we discussed the landscape, uh, the landscape observatories, which are decision support systems, which are bridges between the civil society science and policy makers. But the, but the politicians need to be also policy makers who understand 
what policy they are making, not only from tomorrow populistic issues. So that, that is my my view on that exactly. May I add um, some aspects to that? Of course. <laughs> uh, yes, so I am wildlife biologist. So I'm fan of biodiversity. I like biodiversity, of course, but uh, we have to be honest. So the biodiversity is uh, not always good, not always benefiting. There are some costs. There are some species that are harmful for the agricultural production, for example, these are pests. So if we create these green corridors, for example, or we, we uh, make large uh, afforestations on a large scale, we will face with uh, several problems like uh, game damage. Lots of big herbivores, large herbivores will appear there, white boar, red deer, and so on, and they will cause damages in the agriculture crops. And many other problematic species, nuisance species can uh, occur there. So if we think about that, first of all, we have to predict these negative influences too. And after that, we have to find uh, an equivalent value in which we can compare the costs and the benefits and uh, the economists has many effort, made many efforts to, to find these. What are the values of the biodiversity? What does it mean value of biodiversity? So uh, they try to create models and uh, they try to uh, uh, in, in, um, integrate these, these models into these biodiversity strategies. And I'm afraid that, that uh, these are not uh, really accepted now, and uh, these are not obvious, not not really frequent to do these 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 models. So I hope that uh, the environmental economists will develop this kind of models, and these will be a part of these decision making support systems. Uh, because telling the truth, a farmer is interested in the short-term profit. And every kind of businessman is interested in that. It is very difficult to speak about the long-term problems. Let's see the global climate change and others. We, we cannot, the, the human being uh, cannot think for longer time, 10 of years or, or 100 years. This is the problem. Yeah, so actually we have to find this kind of the, this kind of arguments and evidences and impact assessments because these are important. Thank you. Thanks, Lazo. So at the end it's a matter, it's only two keywords. The first one is education, according to Shanda, and the second one is money, according to you. Okay. Yeah, but there is another factor in all of this, which I think it, it would be uh, would it be wrong with Uniscape not to put its hand up and say that obviously Uniscape is an organization of universities that's committed in the first instance to the delivery on the principles and the promise of the European Landscape Convention. And I think that one of the great strengths of the convention is that it's not just about the environment, it's about culture and the environment and this kind of the, the, um, the symbiosis, the interconnectivity mm. of the two. And the problems we are facing, the problems that were mapped out both by Sandor and by Giuseppe are ones that are created by human culture. And unless we embrace uh, human behavior and education through that, then we're not going to change. So I think to come back to your question, Carmelo, there, um, there is a piece of international policy in existence uh, the European Landscape Convention that espouses those big principles. And it is not being acted on universally, even by the yes. countries that have signed up to it. There's a lack of understanding about precisely what obligations are contained within it. There's a lack of understanding about the, uh, the rationale, the logic, the epistemological uh, kind of background of research that's gone on for an awful long time, generations at this stage, that that leads us, um, you know, to where we are now. And so um, speaking from Ireland, for example, we have 
uh, signed up to the National Landscapes or, or, or t t t to the European Landscape Convention. We've developed a national landscape strategy and it's just flatlining. There's nothing happening. It's completely, uh, completely moribund. But the, the encouraging thing is that it is beginning to, uh, to um, be visible at local level. Um, so local authorities and farming communities themselves, and, and, and in a way our experience is a little bit different from that that other speakers have described, but we're seeing an appetite among local communities. And so we're seeing uh, children, teenagers, students demanding a different type of agriculture. And we're beginning to see that happening. We're beginning to see the vocabulary changing and attitudes changing. And it's not because of the European Landscape Convention, it's because of um, the, the wall of sound that's hitting us through, uh, through multimedia concerning the urgency of the issues that are surrounding us. Now, maybe it's a luxury of living in the first world that we can afford to embrace these challenges and respond to them. But I really feel that, that to, to, to come back to your summarization, Carmelo, yes, it's education and yes, it's money, but it's also using the policy instruments that already exist and not just signing up to them because it's a nice thing to do when you're the best child in the classroom, but signing up to them with real commitment and understanding and also allowing the science, the knowledge, not just the education, but the knowledge to inform decision-making. Yes. Uh, yes, Connor, the local societies are extremely important. We completed a, a, a pan-European survey uh, in uh, 2011. Uh, it was called TAS, Transactional Environmental Support Systems. When we uh, surveyed the decision making, the influence, uh, information flows, and the decision making, and uh, it was clear that uh, the majority, huge majority of the decisions are made at very local level. So, so yes, I absolutely agree with you. We have to make influence on the local people, local communities. They they should decide about these issues. Um, we have a comment there from Timmy Tillman just to say we need an alliance of scientists and the local knowledgeable people, not only scientists as in the video about lakes. Absolutely. Thank you for the session. Thanks yes. for the comment, uh, Timmy. Yes. I think uh, we... Can I say something? Oh, yes, of course. Yes. Just... We, we need, I think, also a connection, connections between people, between science. So especially when we talk about landscape, when we talk about the regional scale. So and uh, we, we need to have a, a sort of uh, holistic approach, even even in science. So we need to connect people because the people, uh, people uh, have a sort of uh, different perspectives. So we need to connect people to, to achieve one, uh, one, one common perspective. Mm -hmm. yes. I think that is very important. So connection, uh, even even this field of policy and, and everything is very important because it could, could stimulate politicians, could stimulate uh, everything. Otherwise, politicians will show to us what they want. Mm -hmm. yes. My sense is that communities right across Europe are really, there's a, th 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 there's a strong sense of the of the importance and value of community. And there's a variety of different factors that are pulling us apart. Um, so globalization, multimedia, even um, the circumstances that we're all living under right now in terms of geographical restrictions on our movements and so on. And that, um, the linkage that's been made by the landscape observatories is that what's good for communities is good for the environment and vice versa. So the two things work together. Um, and I think that that sense of kind of belongingness of um, the interdependency that is such a rich kind of value of communities right across the world is something that can be harnessed 
towards the good of the environment. And so kind of to use the expression, what's sauce for the goose is sauce for the gander. In other words, what's good for people tends to be good for the environment as well. Yes. And I think that's the lesson that, 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 that the younger generation is learning. Actually, it's our generation who need to match their understanding with real action and uh, not allow the short uh, uh, termism of, of the body politic to obstruct this from happening. And now we're in a, I mean, at this point, we're in a state of emergency. We have to apply the brakes in an emergency fashion. So the, um, the time for talking is over in some ways, you know. And listen, perhaps the time for talking is over. So um, if I can just take the opportunity to thank uh, our speakers and the audience uh, for your contributions. This has been very stimulating and I'm sure that we could uh, continue this well into the night. Um, to remind everyone, in case you arrived in late to the meeting, that the next lecture, and we will announce this in good time, on the 1st of June is going to be from Boss Lagerquist, who is here still. I, I can't see where you've moved. On. Oh, there you are. You're up at the, right there beside me. Um, and there's a very deep uh, connection between the direction this conversation has been going and the talk that Boss is going to offer us on landscape-based eco-museums uh, and um, uh, the use of, of uh, community participation and the green circular economy in uh, the drive for landscape conservation. So that will be a very interesting paper and it, and it will be the last of the lectures before the summer break and then we'll take up the running again in September. So we look forward to seeing you all on the 1st of June. So thank you everybody for that. <laughs>